I don't know, I feel very frustrated. I keep wanting to say to the girls, listen, you can have a longer career if you keep those, if you keep those panties on. <laughs> you tell them, Shirley. You know? <laughs> you tell them. No, but you know what I mean? I mean, unless you're really incredibly smart and brilliant like Madonna was with your sexuality, don't step into that pool. That's how I feel. I mean, there's a few women who carry off the, like I think Rihanna's incredibly sexual and it's exciting to me and powerful and somewhat threatening and also intriguing and somehow she manages to maintain mystery by being incredibly sexual. But not everyone can play that game and carry it off like she can. And so I think unless you can play in the pool with Madonna and Rihanna, keep your panties on. <laughs> Good advice, Shirley Manson. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Elia Einhorn. Welcome to the Talkhouse Music Podcast. Here at the Talkhouse, we pair notable musicians for thoughtful, unmoderated conversations and release new talks each week. Regular listeners will have caught recent episodes like Kathleen Hanna with Meredith Graves or the Nationals Matt Berninger and Connor Oberst going deep on the art of songwriting. Check out these and all of our past episodes and subscribe to get new ones on Stitcher or iTunes. Tori Amos and Garbage's Shirley Manson ruled the 90s alternative music charts with hits like Cornflake Girl and Only Happy When It Rains, inspiring a generation of young musicians and making Rock's Boys Club look stale and exclusive. And they continue to make vital music today. Amos and Manson are old friends, and last month the two sat down for a proper catch-up on the Talkhouse Music Podcast. Tori Amos has one of the most passionate fan bases of any living songwriter. Her fearlessness in bluntly calling out the patriarchy insistence on giving voice to those who have experienced sexual trauma, and defiantly forging her own career path time and again, have drawn to her a loyal audience of people who feel like outsiders. Her liner notes to the new reissue of her album, Boys for Pele, state, this is the record where I fought for my life. Her songs were helping tens of thousands of fans fight for their own lives as well. Released in 1996, Boys for Pele was Amos's third LP, and the first she produced herself. Named for the Hawaiian volcano goddess Pele, the album featured poetic lyrics concerning self-growth and mythology, accompanied by Bosendorfer piano and harpsichord. 20 years on, the classic album is getting a full anniversary deluxe reissue, featuring never-before-heard demo versions, outtakes, and remastered audio. It'll be released on November 18th. Garbage formed in Madison, Wisconsin, releasing their self-titled first album in 1995. They ascended the alt-music ranks, selling millions and millions of albums, propelled by the magnetic charisma of Scottish singer Shirley Manson, a true take-no-bullshit frontwoman. She's since laughingly stated that nobody could outrude me. Manson relocated to Los Angeles and has branched out into acting. She has also collaborated with Queens of the Stone Age and written for Sky Ferreira. Garbage released their sixth album, Strange Little Birds, this summer. Amos and Manson's warm and open conversation covers revisiting their younger selves in early work, the constraints society puts on aging women, the film Audrey and Daisy being a powerful teaching tool against sexual assault and the song Amos wrote for it, being ginger ninjas, what they call warrior women stuff, motherhood, and the patriarchy in the music business. They even offer some advice to aspiring female pop stars. Check it out. Hi, Shirley. It's Tori. How are you? Hey, Tori. It's good to hear your voice. It's so good to hear your voice. How are you? I'm very well. Where are you? I am in Los Angeles. You? I'm in the UK. Isn't that funny? <laughs> <laughs> so ironic. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just thinking this morning, actually, the last time I actually saw your beautiful face was in Wagamama's in London. I don't know if you remember. I was there with my sister and we knocked into you in Wagamama's. Oh, yeah. When was that? I think it was shortly before you um, had your first baby. I think it was that long ago. My goodness. She's 16 now, Shirley. Can you believe that? Oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is freaky. 
I know, and tall. Well, and, congratulations. Well, thanks. Do you remember you sent her the cutest little outfit when she was a baby? Oh, I she, do remember. So cute. <laughs> That's so crazy. Yeah, she, she's about 5'7", five, 5'8", five, now. Yeah, she's tall. That is unbelievable. She's still at school? I hope so. Yeah, she's at school. She's in England here. And it's, so you're in Los Angeles. Oh, she got... I am, and you will never guess who is my, literally my next door neighbor, is Matt Chamberlain. Oh, no way. <laughs> uh-huh. Like, isn't that weird? Yeah, amazing guy, amazing drummer. Boy, do I like playing with that Incredible guy. Incredible player. Mm. Yeah, I'll bet. So I think of you often when I see Matt, because I always think of you for some reason when I see him. Um, partly, I think, because I heard him play on your records. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's my Which is spiritual. Why we grabbed him for hours. Yeah, my spiritual brother. Yeah, he's such an amazing, um, yeah. inspirational dude. Yeah. So talk to me. The, I love this new record. I love this strange little birds. I just thank you. I love it. Well, I am beautiful. I'm very flattered that you would would say such a lovely thing, and uh, I believe that you have a twentieth anniversary of. Uh, <laughs> It's Boyd's for Pelly, right? Yeah, can you believe it? 20 years. It doesn't seem like 20 years. Well, what blows my mind is that it's not your first record, because we just celebrated our, the 20th anniversary of our first record in November last year. But the fact that this is, what, your third, third record? Yeah, the third 20th. Isn't, that's kind of funny. Yeah, it's unbelievable, but congratulations. We made it, Tori. We made it. We survived. Exactly, and congratulations <laughs> to you, Shirley. A 20 years always, I don't know if you feel this way, but when we were remastering this for the re-release, and we found a few tracks that didn't make the record at the time, and it just transports me back and, and the guys that worked on it, Mark and Marcel were working on it, and they were doing the re um you know, we were doing some remixes for the B-sides, and all of a sudden, you're back 20 years ago. I don't know if it was like that with you guys. Mm, yeah, it's some kind of sensory sort of, uh, like, time travel. It's really mad. Yeah, but the, the, the I know what you mean about that sort of weird sensory thing, that all of a sudden you can... I, I mean, I, I literally had this strange memory of like the, the skirt that I was wearing when you know we played our first few shows you know I had to I think a lot of people I think a lot of people surely have a memory of the skirt you were wearing 20 years ago <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean I can, I remember, can remember the, the skirt the you were wearing surely I can remember <laughs> for fuck's sake <laughs> Now listen, don't get saucy with me, Tori. I missed well, this early in the in the morning. It's yeah. still early here. I'm allowed. I'm 53. <laughs> I can be saucy. A, a menopausal saucy. <laughs> no, but hey, we're in the Redhead Club, right? Gin, ginger. We nin- are in the Redhead Club. G- ginger ninjas. Yeah, ginger ninjas. Although, of course, we've we've both flirted with uh, all kinds of hair colors over the years, as have you. Um, I'm currently not red. Are you? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you're you're red, full red. I'm red. Yes, I am. What what are you right yeah. now? Are you but blonde? I, I, are you blonde? Makes, I see. I'm feeling. No, I'm pink. Fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Very good. I actually dyed my hair pink for my twentieth anniversary, and then never left. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it so much. I, sort of. I'm, I haven't yet to go back to my true self, or despite the pleas of many of the fans. <laughs> But, um, so are you going to be touring to celebrate? Actu- what are you doing to actually celebrate and note this moment in your life? Well, uh, we're going to tour next year, 2017, with a new record. Right. So we're, we're recording right Ooh. now. Yeah, it's... it's, right. it's a br- brand new studio record. Yep, that's right. And it, what's strange is when you're doing these 20-year things, it's... um. I don't, I don't know about you, but I hadn't listened to Pele in a long time. And so you're kind of forced yeah. in order to, to do the remastering and, and get it ready. You're forced to listen to yourself. And I, I have to tell you, there were moments I was listening to that record and I would think, wow, that, is, um, that girl is angry. <laughs> She's an angry person. Wow. And I don't know if you listened back to You don't feel that. angry anymore? No, not like that. I think um, at the time, mm-hmm. I was um, battling. I was in battles at the time. 
And maybe you, you all were in battles after your first or second record, whereas sometimes the, there's an expectation um, of people that want you to, to remake the records you just made. And I felt like I really mm-hmm, didn't want to do that. Do you still feel a connection with those songs then if you feel a sort of disconnect from that sort of type of anger? When you revisited the record, when you were mastering it, did you, did you connect with the songs in a different way? Or did you feel a disconnect? Or what was, what was that experience? Because I had a, a, a strange experience myself just listening to that record, our first record, when we were remastering for our 20th. What was it like? I was curious how you felt. It was really surreal. I, too, sort of revisited this for myself in a funny way. Um, and, and yet some of the songs had an f- even deeper reson- resonance for me now, funnily enough, than when we first recorded them. But like which I'm ones? curious how you felt like, about like, yours. Like which ones? Well, for a song like Heaven is Wide, for a random example, which was sort of challenging the Catholic Church, hmm. um, uh, it it had further resonance, deeper resonance for me now than than then would be a random example. Mm. Um, I felt, you know, equally as enraged, equally as sort of, uh, you know, that nothing seems to have changed really or that it's taken so long to actually have people acknowledge that this happened to people. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, I know, I know that you know what I mean. That's a sort of silly question. I know that you do. No, I, um, we recorded part of Pele in a church and in Ireland. Um, it was a Protestant church, not a Catholic church. As you might know, my, my dad is a Protestant minister. Um, you ca- I were, do know this. Were you a Catholic <laughs> girl? You're, you were brought up Catholic, right? No. I wasn't, but my dad was um, my Sunday school teacher, also a Protestant believer. So I think we've actually discussed our, our fathers before. Like it has a, a big impact growing up. There's a lot of father energy on Pele, although Pele is the Hawaiian goddess um, of the volcano. And at the time, I was immersed in some of the dark goddess mythologies. I had spent. Um, some time in Hawaii on one of the islands. One of my friends was kind of there for, I guess, a year. And we were on tour during Under the Pink in in 94. And I popped over to see her when we had a break. And she talked to me in depth about um, being open to the energy. And and having lived in Hawaii for about a year by then, she just said, "I, I really think you should be open to it. And so I guess, Shirley, that was when... I started researching some of the mythologies of, they call them, I guess, uh, the dark goddesses Kali and Pele and Inanna. And and it really made me realize some of the battles um, archetypally that um, were awakening in me because I was battling, I guess you could say, the patriarchy, um, the corporate side mm-hmm. of the music business. As you know, sometimes the music business can be very much the boys' club. And we love we love some of them. Some of them are great. Sometimes. Sometimes some of them are sometimes. great. Sometimes. Yes, but sometimes some, <laughs> sometimes some of them treat, treat us like objects instead of um, sovereign, independent women. And so I know you know that battle mm-hmm. very well. Yeah. So did you, when now as a, an adult, a fully realized adult, a mother of a 16-year-old child, listening to back to that record, did it change the way you heard it? Or were you just, did you feel proud of yourself? Did you feel like you got a lot out there that you needed to get out there? I mean, what was your experience listening to it? I think that there, there were issues that I hadn't... Um, talked about in that way. I think the two records before Little Earthquakes and um, Under the Pink, although there were moments in those records of um, blood curdling. Revelation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. War, warrior woman stuff. I don't think that I really got to some of the issues until Pele. And I, I wouldn't really be sitting here the same person, I guess, if I, if I hadn't made Boys for well. Pele. So I'm glad mm-hmm. I did it at the time. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it having a teenager because it's a different energy um, 
It's not course, something, yeah. you know, it's those energies, I think, are something you need to, to tackle at a certain time in your life. Mm-hmm. And so that, that was the right time. So it's, it's, was it a relief one, when you made Boys Repelli? Was it a relief to get some of that out of, the, out of yourself onto record as a sort of witness in some ways? Well, it was a, it a was, testimony. It was an awakening, I guess, because I don't know if you felt this, but I'm sure in your life, um, people see Shirley in a certain way, no different than they see, you know, the marks that are on the call or anybody else in a certain way. And I'm sure people listening, they're they're friends that might see you. You kind of you kind of fill out a certain role in a friendship group or in the family mm-hmm. or whatever it is. And I think Pele blew that out of the water for me and made me realize that there were sides to myself that might not be the happy, smiley person in the group or the one trying to make everything okay. And sometimes I needed to acknowledge that side of the self. So it was a real wake up, this record. And I have to tell you, sometimes I find it difficult to listen to, so it's a warning to everybody. It's not necessarily (laughs) a a party piece, but there you go. Uh Uh-huh. And so you, you're bringing out this 20th anniversary um, re-release and then you're bringing out a new record. At what point next year have you not, not, yeah. not sure. I, um, we're, it's early, it's early yeah. stages with that. And I, want, I wanted to ask you about the new record, Strange Little Birds, because I think it's one of the most beautiful records. Um, you know, it's gorgeous, gorgeous record. Thank you. So t- talk to me about some of the... Um, inspiration behind it and how you all wrote the songs and well yeah I mean god I feel like I've been talking about it all year at this point so it's sort of lost its its gloss at that point I'd much rather talk to you about you and your music <laughs> I've been I've been on I've been on the grind now all year but um we're, but sure, we're it's really so proud gorgeous. of this record it's gorgeous oh thank you tori i really appreciate you saying that um and I, I i mean i'm really proud of it i feel like it's a really great record and i feel like we went somewhere new with it which is always a relief um you know i work in a band that's much more private than i am you know like if i had my druthers i would just throw everything out there because that's just the kind of human being i am but, you know, I'm tethered in a band with people I love who I have to respect their boundaries as well, you know? And That's interesting. I, you so know, I, I didn't to, think of it like yeah. that. Fair, that's a really fair mm, point. I sort of have to tread carefully sometimes, but I also, when coming to making this record, felt that if I wasn't really open in certain areas, I would go mad. You know, I didn't just want to write within a certain boundary I felt like I had to step over a boundary but also respect there so um, in some ways I feel like this record for me was a real relief in some ways and I feel like I pushed the band and the band pushed me and we went somewhere new and after 21 years that's a real triumph I think because yeah, it's it a, a band and yeah and it's it's beautiful and sort of cinematic it's dark um and it's also trying to explore what it means to be a human being right now in this culture that we're living in where everyone's so desperate to please and desperate to pretend and desperate to deny because we're mm. so scared of revealing our real self and so that's really sort of the motivation of that record and um it's been it w- a, a revelation in in terms of i thought we'd come up against a lot more resistance from the fan base and and we didn't they seem to have embraced it and they seem to be happy to go along on this sort of journey with us which is always a you know for lack of a better word it's such a cliche but it's a really beautiful experience when that happens you know Mm. like like, you know you find a little little air pocket where you can breathe properly it's lovely i think this record too surely joyous experience yeah i i I think that this record too the one um that you just put out Strange Little Birds, has this um, raw but luxurious energy to it. And in a way, that can those two energies seem like a paradox, but here on the record, you've brought them together, you and the band, and I really felt like I, I knew this woman singing to me, Scre- sometimes screaming, sometimes um, with these gorgeous harmonies that reminded me of... Um, the most beautiful harmonies, similar to Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, but with a with a um, 
uh, driving uh, explosive track behind it. So it it was the merging of the sacred and the profane that that you have been able to do with this. That I felt like I can Ooh, have a tequila. Totally. Oh, thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> 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 Lovely. Oh, well, thank you. It's coming from you, a, a, a master of of that technique yourself. I'm I'm really really flattered. Um, and so. To you, uh, to get back to you, because I really am really bored of hearing myself speak. (laughs) I was in Kansas last weekend and I watched Audrey and Daisy, which I had been avoiding for some reason since it had come out, um, you know, a month or so ago. And I finally managed to sit down and watch it. And um, I had no idea that your song was the closing song. And of course, when your voice kicks in at the end of the movie, which was already pretty harrowing to watch, um, and yet also I'm so grateful I watched it. But when your voice kicks in at the end, of course, I was left in floods of tears. Um, but I did want to bring this up, and I don't know how comfortable you are bringing up. We don't necessarily have to speak about the movie, but I really wanted to, um, first of all, say what an incredible movie it is and uh, how important I think it is for us all to, to see and, and really get a kick in the teeth and, and a, a, a wake-up call to how our culture is and how we're educating our children. It's a tough watch, Shirley. I, I know it is, and it was tough when I watched it the first time. And um, so for anybody out there listening, yes, it, it's a tough watch. And yet I think I've been saying it's a must-watch because we, yeah. know, we know the issues Which I would there. agree with, by the way. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, we know that it's been happening in our universities, but when I saw it and realized that it's permeated through our high schools and um, our middle schools, the issue of sexual assault, it it was a real, um, it just kicked me in the teeth. And so I'm encouraging people to watch it, and and yet I'm I'm giving them a little warning so that they can have a blanket nearby and a cup of tea and realize that yeah. it, in the end, though, I was um, at least, my eyes were opened, and I feel like any, yeah. anybody that's over 21, we have to be aware, we're, we're adults, and we have to be aware that this is going on. And it, it was so sad for me, Shirley, that our kids are doing this to our kids and that our kids didn't yeah. realize what what abuse is and what being a um a predator is and you're thinking about some of these boys at 15 16 17 and they're predators and they didn't even realize that they're doing this so you think yeah. okay well we have to then talk about it and we need to you know respect them enough to have the conversation absolutely yeah but i also think you know as as difficult as the movie is to watch, Audrey and Daisy, um, I want to encourage people to push through their discomfort. You know, I, I know that a lot of people say, oh, is it harrowing? I did the same thing myself. Oh, is it harrowing? I don't really want to watch it. And then I felt a, a duty to watch it. And I'm grateful I did. You know, it taught me a lot. And I think we have to, in, in issues... Um, any kind of sexually related sexual assaults, uh, sexual violence, they're all things that we don't necessarily want to visit. But I think we really must, and we must encourage young people to start to understand at an early age what, what, what powers they, they embody. You know, I think young men and young women, they have this, all this power and they haven't been taught what it is, how to manage it, how it can threaten others, how it can, you know... Um, fascinate others you know there's there's just so much information in in our educations that we're we're missing out on I think yeah you're right Shirley and there's so much shame there's so much shame that gets put on um to the to your feelings and to the victim to the victim um and and it just seems like that, uh, for instance, Daisy is out there going to schools talking to other teenagers about her struggle and her very tough journey, and she's out there with Delaney at times visiting schools and talking. Audrey didn't make it. Audrey isn't with us anymore. That's the tragedy of this piece. 
but her mother is out there, Sheila, going into schools and talking. So the fact that the conversation is continuing by these, to me, these heroines, and that was what the song A Flicker was really trying to do is to is to tell both stories, Audrey's tragic story and that her light uh, was extinguished all too soon and that Daisy and Delaney have become phoenixes out of the ashes. Uh, and they carry, yeah, they carry the torch and they talk about it, and that's not an easy thing to do. So those women were such an inspiration no. to me. Yeah, and it comes across in the movie. I mean, they, they're phenomenally strong figures, you know, a light, you know. Um, and so I think the film does definitely end on a very hopeful upswing. But I was curious how how you got involved. Was it through your involvement with Rain that they approached, the filmmakers approached you, or are they friends of yours, or I what's think the connection there? Net, yeah, Netflix was very aware, uh, a couple people over there, about Rain, and knew right. that I've been involved since 1994. So I think they sent the film over wondering if if I heard any music, and at first, I, I couldn't say anything after watching it the first time, but when I watched it the second time, I saw the mantra above Daisy's brother's head, and it said, um, monsters are made, not born. And the muses were <laughs> screaming at the top of their lungs like the Valkyries coming over. And pause, <laughs> pause went on, on on the screen, and they said, this is, this is the way in. This is the way in. This is the key. That well, will unlock the song. So, yeah. So, thank you, Muse. Oh, bravo Sis. to you, Tori Amos. You have been such a beacon for women and men, of course, who have endured any kind of sexual assault since, certainly since I've been aware of you, you know, um, and your involvement with Rain and, and, and your beautiful articulation of it in your music. Oh, and, surely. Um, and no, but it's really true. I mean, it's. You, you really were one of the very first artists that I can remember who spoke up about your own experiences and that in turn has inspired many others to do the same and follow in your footsteps. And once more, you know, by artists participating in that, we pulled down one of the curtains behind which, you know, perpetrators hide. So, you know, so much love to you, not just for your incredible music, but for that stance you've ta bravely taken. And uh, I, I mean that really sincerely. Um, well, and surely, you know, yeah, the you, thing your, is that your influence continues. The people that come to the shows, and there's so many people that share their stories. And uh, every time somebody talks about what they've had to go through, um, the damage that it's caused in their life, and, and how not to keep acting out of the damage, I think that's um, been a real. Mm, Oh, God, a heart-sharing moment when somebody takes your hand and tells you their story. And I'm sure you've heard many stories from people who talk to you and share course, that with you. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it really does. It's a club. You know, you feel like, oh, my God, goodness, they've changed my view today. They've made me see something different. Yeah. So thanks to all those people out there. Yeah, it's who, such a privilege, right? Yeah, it really is. I mean, to me, that's one of the greatest privileges of being an artist is that you hear people's secrets, you know, um, much like confessionals almost, and you know that you are the you are the preserver of those secrets, you know, and it feels like we're all in this sort of strange woven fabric together, and it's a very bonding experience when that occurs, I think. It is, and, and a lot of, I, I feel they don't tell it to be absolved, as in the confessional. They, they're, no. they're really um, confiding something a lot of the time, and it it does amaze me how songs start to come when I'm listening to somebody and they might be talking about a different song, whether, whether I wrote it or not. They might be talking about a song that's influenced their life and how they began to realize they wanted to change their life and not, and, 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 you know, just being a part of that sometimes, surely you realize that that's why we're artists and that's, as you say, the privilege of being one. Mm. It brings me great joy. But, to, you know, the other thing I was curious about is as, you know, your daughter has grown up 
I guess it sticks in my mind because of, like I said, the last time we met, I can really remember it as if it was yesterday in Wagamama's in London. <laughs> we, <laughs> we knocked into each other in line. And um, I was curious how, because I'm not a mother, I didn't have children, I chose not to. But I'm curious how, you know, having a, a child, being her protector in the world, how that has changed your work. I mean, it must change your work, particularly as we we both, you know, grow up and get older. And um, I know that even as a, a, a woman who has chosen not to have children proceeds as an artist, things change. But that must really accelerate in some ways that that maybe that growth or that desire to to explore further when you have a child or children. Well, surely the thing is to be really honest. I. Being a parent isn't for everybody, and there have been people. That, I'm, I'm, I absolutely agree with you wholeheartedly. There are people that come up to me that come to the shows and just say, "You know, I know people who really aren't aren't happy um, being parents," and that might surprise people listening. But it, it isn't for everybody because it is a life changer. It really, really is. And if you don't want your life to change, and I mean upside down, then it might not be for you because you do need to put them first and not, and not everybody, not everybody wants to do that. So I feel like for me, being a mom, as we know, it doesn't come with a, um, instructions (laughs) and (laughs) I I get it wrong a lot of the time. I do. I get it wrong. So it's humbling. Everybody does. I mean, it's, it can be really humbling because you sort of say, gosh, I wish I hadn't said it that way. I wish I hadn't done that. And you do see yourself acting like your own parents. And sometimes like, I can't <laughs> believe I just did an Ed Amos on my kid. I can't believe that. Yeah. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but but your parents weren't artists, correct? You didn't grow up in a household of artists. No, no, did no, you? no, no. My dad. And your father was your father was a minister. Yes. And your mum? Did she, she work? She didn't. She was. She would say we were her work, and you know what we were. Yeah. I think being a homemaker is yeah. so challenging and difficult, because she had wanted to have a career, and I saw that through my life. She was. Um, she left college to to support my dad, and that I'm that's a different time. Um, those amazing women in our lives, and I'm sure you've known many women like that who who put their career aside to to bring up the family. And without my mom, I, I wouldn't be talking to you right now because she was she's the reason I didn't go absolutely insane. Yeah, are your parents alive? Oh, yeah, they are. They, they are. They're yeah, kind, they're God, you're so lucky. I am, you know what? I am very fortunate. And they're sort of having a teenage period now where they're taking a road trip. Oh, God. <laughs> 87 and 88, rocking down the East Coast. No, My come folks. on. I'm serious. Hey, they're probably wow. listening to garbage in the car, rocking <laughs> those two, having another, <laughs> I don't know, a, a, a second honeymoon type teenage and it's really exciting to see. It really, really is. Yeah, that's rad. It's inspiring, <laughs> right? Yeah, totally inspiring. Yeah, there. It's pretty. Yeah, cool. you'll do the same now because you've been. Yeah, you've been shown the way forward by your parents. You'll be kicking up your heels at ninety if you're lucky, <laughs> God willing. Oh, and you. You <laughs> got. You has. You got to yeah. still be wearing those skirts, surely. Oh God forbid! Shoot me if I'm wearing no, those skirts. They're at legendary. 90. Although I don't know. I, <laughs> yeah. I'm, <laughs> There is a desire just to not conform, I must say. I, I continue to, I don't know about you how you feel, but as I've gotten older, I realize how many constraints that are still in our society upon age, you know, aging women, women who are no longer 30 and, you know, how all, so many of my friends talk about, and I'm the same, by the way, but talk about age-appropriate dressing. You know, I can't, people say to me, oh, you dyed your hair pink. I wish... I wish I could dye my hair pink, and I'm thinking, well, there's absolutely nothing stopping you dyeing your hair pink um, other than sort of conventions and ideas of conventions. And I, I feel as I've gotten older, I want to, like, push against that more and more. And if somebody thinks I shouldn't wear a short skirt, all the more reason why I should. Yeah, why not? I don't not? know how you feel. Why uh, not, Shirley? I, 
Well, I think, look, <laughs> when you don't, listen, this is the thing. When you don't have kids, it is it is a little bit different because, you know, you of do. Of course it's different. You do what yeah. you want when you want. But I think there's, yeah. there's this thing where I'm, I don't show up at school a lot. It's, I, I really don't. We, we have a very um, tight relationship. She's one of my dearest friends in the world. And I really enjoy spending time with her. But as an American, I don't understand the British school system. And I also thought that um, it was better that, that I didn't stalk her too much at school. So I don't really go to the school a lot. But I think it is one of those things when when you're when you're acting more as a mom and not Tori on stage. I make different decisions when I walk into musician and that being. Then there has to be freedom. It it can't just be all right. So the mom is behind the piano. I don't really. I have to segregate them in 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 um. In a judicious way, because sometimes the mom is like, oh, dear, you're really saying those words again, T.A.? Okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but, but maybe, perhaps, you don't want to say them to your, to your kid. But maybe you do. It just it depends. But you do have to think, think things through. And I guess being a mom was the thing I needed, Shirley. That's the thing that I needed to kick my butt. Because that's just what I needed to... Um, get myself out of an emotional rut. So it was the right thing for me, but I know it's not the right thing for everybody. And and it's been the most challenging thing I've ever done is to be, to be yeah, a but, mom. Yeah. Yeah. But again, a, a, an insane privilege. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you, I mean, you've talked about, you've sort of imagined yourself, I mean, even in, in Boys for Pelly, I, like one of the songs I, I feel like is it Little Amsterdam where you imagine being a mum? Like clearly you wanted to be a mum. Like I've just never identified with having a desire to be a mother at all. Like it just doesn't exist in me. Respect. But totally you know, respect, I think, Yeah, I I totally respect that. I re I completely and totally but, respect that. Yeah, but I also envy that. Like I'd love to have had that sort of desire. But yeah, isn't you know, you imagine didn't you write that song from the sort of the perspective of your child, almost, or well, you know, as a as a mum. Sometimes, sometimes I guess archetypally, I've identified more with Demeter. Um, back in the if if we think of the Greek pantheon, um, than say Persephone, and and yet we I I can understand Persephone's um, story, but I always felt. Um, something deep in my heart, as as the mom, and I don't I I don't know where it comes from. I don't know what it is, but not everybody identifies with that. And and um, I know I've known people, mothers, that have just said to me, you know, this is a lot. Hmm, this is different than I thought it would be because you can't just give them back. It's not like your nieces and nephews oh, where you, you can turn them in at the end of the day and say, bye. Yeah, you see, my mom, my mom was an orphan. Mm. And so she was just, she was sort of given back, so to speak. And then she, she raised her children as, as her main career in her life. And I think I just looked at that and got really terrified of it, feeling that I would be obliterated by having children. I mean, you know, clearly I was mis, you know, misled in some regards but I think I, I responded to the, the whole concept of my mum being an orphan just as it was just too much for me Fair I was enough. like what if I get this wrong and I have to turn my child back in it would be so bad so I think I just avoided the whole thing but how do you parse being a mum and when you go on stage because I've seen you play and I know that you are like this warrior goddess when you're on stage a very sexual <laughs> very potent uh, how do you, like when you go on stage, tell me what it feels like when you step on stage to play your songs and do you divorce yourself from being a mom and just be a free bird or what? what's happening? Well, I think... What happens when you go on stage? I prepare about, when, once sound check starts and you've seen people at the stage door and they have their requests, then I start stepping into it at, st at sound check. Almost, um, you be 
become a container. And so the person that I am or my crap and the phone call you had that morning that didn't go so well, what it, you know, whatever it is, all the stuff that we all have, then self says to self, okay, you just need to move that over and be a container and hold the songs. And, and that's really what you need to do. So there, there is a transformational process, almost... Um, it's an agreement that I've made with the songs over the years since I guess I was really little that if they were to come to me, then I needed to get my butt out of the way so that the songs could then be clear and, and not have my fingerprints all over it. If I've had a bad day, then I'm projecting onto that song what it doesn't want. So it's, it's been about clarity and stepping into that. So are you one of these performers, though, that love performing? Or are you one of these people who dutifully does it? Or are you exhausted by it? You know, I, I, it's, uh, there's, there's nothing in this world that is, um, wow. I've never had a drug. I've never had a, a glass of wine. And I've had some pretty good wine in my lifetime. I've never had... <laughs> And let's let's keep let's keep holding your child out of this because I, that's a very different energy. But I've never experienced experience and thing. Yeah, a communion, a kind of communion as you can with an audience, and it's a love affair. It's um that it's hard for me to just explain to people listening, but it truly is a love affair, and um. It's a collaboration, I guess, between songs moving through my body, so I'm sort of a circuit board, to them, and then their energy coming back. And I've never felt so much, ah, uh, wow, um, yeah. energy. So you love it then? You're one of these people who, are, who love it. Uh, beyond love. I don't know what the word surely is, <laughs> beyond that love. That makes me happy. It's beyond love. <laughs> It's be, it's beyond yeah. it's be, um, it's beyond yeah yeah I I mean I wholeheartedly agree it's like my most it's my most excited self you know on stage I love it too but and then what's your relationship with the studio because for me that I find the studio very difficult very challenging well uh, okay so <laughs> this is sort of weird to say but I feel like I'm just talking to you so you know I'm just going to tell you. Um, I work with Mark, my husband, and we we weren't married when we started working together on tour in '94, and then in in the studio on Boys for Pele, and I guess uh-huh. so. He's when I'm singing down the microphone, and I'm in my little box. There's a box that they built for me that I crawl inside, and the keyboard, the the Busendorfer's keys go under uh, in a slot. So the oh my vocal, God. yeah, and then the harpsichord would go on the other one or the keyboard. So I'm in this little tiny box condo, and with a microphone, and you one can tell oneself that you think that you're just singing uh, your deepest. You you peel that skin back, and you're having this private conversation. <laughs> but on the other side of the mm-hmm. microphone is the person that you're closest to in the whole world. And so they know, or they might not have known until you <laughs> sing it down the microphone what you're really thinking. And so there's this um, sensual, uh, I private, very private conversation that you're having that then you're sharing with the whole world. So we're back to that paradox of something so personal, but he and I are having to come to terms with it first to the point whereby we'll, we'll walk in sometimes and Tasha look, she'll be in the kitchen and go, okay, can I have my parents back now, please? Whatever went on over there, yeah, exactly. I don't want to know. Okay, enough of, enough of that nonsense. Thank you very much. Where's my tea? <laughs> Yeah, and after, be parents. Uh, tea after magic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now, so hold on one one second. So your microphone is in your box with you, correct? That's correct, Shirley. Yes, yes. And so this explains why you have this very unique. I think. Well, I think it might explain why you have this very unique sort of vocal sound. It's a. Com- I've never stopped to think com- about this before. It's a combination of. 
how it's of recorded. Of your voice, obviously. No, no, yeah. no, 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 I don't mean it. Of, of the recording technique and so, and sometimes, sometimes... And the engine, yeah. Yeah, and, the, and sometimes I'm singing, like I'm not in the box right now. I'm looking at the box and it's the doors open, <laughs> waiting for me to go in. But I'm, I'm sitting outside <laughs> I'm so happy the box. For you, Tori. <laughs> <laughs> oh, surely. <laughs> I'll dream oh. of you. <laughs> Listen, though, come see me. Wait, come see me. Will you come see me when I'm out on tour? I'd I love, love to, see to you. come see you. Love to see you. You know, we've been talking about this for years um, about hanging out properly because we have so much in common. You know, because my husband is also our engineer. So we work like that in in a in a way too. Um, oh, I didn't know that. But yeah, so he's yeah, always the quiet space. ones. There, there is a lot of yeah, it's right. Like, yeah, it's always. always the quiet ones that loop us in in the end. Always right. <laughs> Very amusing. So, um, when you two like, are you still signed to your first label? What's your label situation? Oh no, darling, I've been with every label. <laughs> Have you? You, you yeah. move around. You can slut shame me. It's fine. Yeah, I don't mind. Um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. can handle it. You don't <laughs> take heed of that nonsense. Yeah, yeah. I've been and with, so I've, I've been with you, them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you notice a, a difference in how you're treated from label to label? Well, I go record by record now. Um, right. I don't, wow, I, don't, I don't know if it'll be my 16th or 17th coming up, but it's just one of those things where I do think it's about um, making the record that you want to make. And that's easier said than done, as you well know better than anybody. Of course. And yeah. what's kind of good at my age is that I'm able to do that. And I, I fought for that like hell on Boys for Pele because I think with the commercial success that Under the Pink had, as you know very well better than anybody, the label, there are people, not everybody, but there are those that want you to repeat that commercial success. And I don't believe you can repeat things. For I, I just don't, even if you tried, even if you and I tried to repeat this conversation, we w- would never. Yeah, happen. we couldn't. <laughs> so it's just futile. Yeah. It's 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 a ridiculous yeah. notion. You made a deliberate choice, right, with Boys for Pelly to sort of cut yourself off, or or at least separate yourself from that pop sort of box, right? You deliberately moved into something more. Uh, Obtuse, I guess, is maybe the better word for it. You know, free or freer, or right? Didn't you? Didn't you decide deliberately that you wanted to make a different kind of record? I did decide, but also where I was in my life at the time, and I've talked about this with other artists, female and and male, that where I was at thirty, whatever I was, there were just um, issues that were coming up, damage I had. A lot of things that I was up to at the time, I was operating from my damaged place. And as you, as you all know, listening, you, you do that until you decide, hang on a minute. I, I don't want to do that anymore. But I had to look at it. I had to look at some of the, st- the choices I was making in my life that just weren't feeling good to me. And so this record was really about, it was like um, my soul was kind of lit on fire and I couldn't escape some of some of the stuff that I had to had to deal with at the time, so you know it's it was a painful record in some ways, but in other ways, um, if I had made it, my friend Neil Gaiman said to me, he said, "Look, T, you got to make this record because because you're not going to be able to live with yourself unless you do, and if you can stick with it, I think you'll find you'll have a different career than if you just um, turn your back on it." And I, he gave me and how good, right he was. He gave me good advice, surely. Good old Neil Gaiman. He sure did. I mean, not there's not a lot of women who've made seventeen records, <laughs> especially, you know, now. I mean, it's it's pretty unusual, and you're in that very select sort of elite crowd who have managed to endure, um, you know, through decades at this point, and that must feel very strange. No. Well, I'm grateful to the people that, if you of think course. about it, it, I wouldn't be able to do it unless... But why do you think you've survived? Why do you think you've survived where... And, I mean, I have my own theories why you have, but I'm curious as to why you think you may have survived where others have failed. Well, 
there's an amazing team of people um, that I'm so blessed to have in my life. And honestly, I, I work as a team. That might sound strange, being a solo artist, quote unquote, but a solo artist is never solo, surely. Even though you you really work with a band and, and you all are engaged in this in this um, um, relationship, all, all of you, it's it is somewhat different as a solo artist. It's not fair to say that that it's the same because, as you know, it, it it is different. In the end, you can kind of say, "Well, maybe we should use a string quartet and not have a band." Maybe we. I don't know. I don't know how the garbage guys <laughs> would respond to that. You just look and say, sure. "Okay, we're bringing a string quartet." Piss off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that wouldn't go down so well. We have to be fair about it. It it is different, and yet yeah. I'm dependent on the team, and have been very lucky to have people in the studio as well as Don Witherspoon. He's been with me since 1992. He's now my manager, and so the, yeah, there are people in your life that that are the reason that you keep going and get inspired. Yeah. But do you think your choice when you made Boys for Pele and bringing all back to this moment, perhaps that choice that you made when you decided that you were going to make a different kind of record and a record that had to be written, you know, it was a, it was a necessary record, but certainly wasn't pop fair necessarily. Do you think that set, you know, as Neil Gaiman pointed out, you know, it was a very different career that you then embarked upon do you think that choice perhaps informed your career uh, uh, and allowed you to have that kind of longevity where you were not subjected to the mores of the day the pop flavor of the day i didn't realize it at the time surely but it was the game changer and and when it came out Mm -hmm. it was met with it was um divisive and it was a tough many months because there were you know people really tearing it to pieces and then there were people really embracing it so at the time of making it and when it came out um i couldn't see that it would be the thing i'd be thanking (laughs) i thank for boys for pele every day of my life I don't know if I'd be making records still because because I might have been caught up in in the commercial releases and as you and I know that can be a really tough road to maintain for 30 years. Sure. Do you notice now in our culture currently that's very difficult for for a lot of artists male and female but I don't specifically want to make this necessarily just about female artists but I think it is a little tougher for women to manage somehow to to eke out a, a long career for themselves when there's so much focus on them being sexual objects in a way. Um, I know that you and I really, for all that we are, very sort of sexually potent. We never made it our main sort of way of communicating. It was always sort of an underlying current um, in, in what we did in our work, but... I, I, for one, know that I deliberately avoided using my sexual, sexuality to sell myself. And I feel like nowadays it seems to me that a lot of young artists really feel the pressure to sell themselves, that if they're not seen as beautiful objects, that somehow they're failing and then therefore they, they fall into these sort of conventional roles that, that women are supposed to embody. Um, you know, do you feel that, I mean, I guess, do you agree with me, Tori? Of course, or do you I agree with you. Of idea course, that? Shirley, I agree with you. I mm-hmm. think it's very tough out there. Um, you know, we were coming up in the '90s when there was a culture of, um, you know, music lovers and people supporting artists. I think now there's there's not a lot of artist development, so the generation coming up now don't get that benefit of. Of mm-hmm. making a failed record and surviving it, you yeah, know, they don't seem to get a chance. You remember, I did that 1988. Why can't we read it? And, and I can smile at it now, and and there are things about it that I that I can embrace. But the thing is, you could you could make a record, as you know, or be part of a band, and it didn't work. And then you're developing, and and there was sort of this um, in, encouragement to expand and to dig further. But 
the times have changed, and so I do think it's really tough on the young artists to to um, figure out what what type of music they want to create, and then to change that. So yeah, I think we, you and I, were quite fortunate that we were um, very fortunate. Yeah, very fortunate. But it seems like their vanity always seems to get the better of them, even when they come out perhaps with a really interesting first record. By the time they hit with their second record, they're already impatient to be. I don't know, they feel impatient and, and, and panicked almost. And so they always revert to appealing to their own vanity and, and all of a sudden the clothes come off. And I don't know, I feel very frustrated. I keep wanting to say to the girls, listen, you can have a longer career if you keep those, if you keep those panties on. <laughs> you tell them, Shirley. You know? <laughs> you tell them. No, but you know what I mean? I mean, unless you're really incredibly smart and brilliant like Madonna was with your sexuality... Don't step into that pool. That's how I feel. I mean, there's a few women who carry off the... Like, I think Rihanna's incredibly sexual, and it's exciting to me and powerful and somewhat threatening and also intriguing, and somehow she manages to maintain mystery by being incredibly sexual. But not everyone can play that game and carry it off like she can. And so I think unless you can play in the pool with Madonna and Rihanna... Keep your panties on. <laughs> Good advice, Shirley Manson. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't know why I've, I've gotten off onto that rant. but Well, uh, I, well I what, I, what I, I want to tell you is I would love to have a margarita with you sometime in 2017. I'm going to come find you. and um, Okay, come find me. I'm going I'm to... Ask very nicely for your for your husband to I let you in that. my care for a couple hours, and I promise to bring you back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'd be delighted <laughs> with your pants but, on. Sorry, I, <laughs> I'm with my pants. My pants will be firmly on. I uh, I wish you good fortune in the studio. Happy hunting, and um, I've loved your music for for as long as I can remember. At this point, I've fallen to, fallen asleep to listening to you in my bunk on the tour bus traveling from city to city and you have a very special place in my heart and uh, this has been a privilege for me this morning and I look forward to the new record and I love you and be safe out there and keep being that amazing beacon of light for so many. Shirley, you're so loved. You You are so loved and I gotta tell you, (laughs) you're still a ginger ninja with your pink hair. I think it's wonderful. I am a ginger ninja. (laughs) Always, Tori. Big love, Shirley. Lots of love. See you soon. You too. Take care. Bye. I'm Elia Einhorn, and you've been listening to Tori Amos and Shirley Manson on the TalkHouse Music Podcast. Subscribe to TalkHouse Music and TalkHouse Film Podcasts on Stitcher or iTunes. Today's show is mixed by Mark Yoshizumi. Upcoming episodes include George Clinton chatting with Soul Clap, and The Arcade Fire's Will Butler with Wyclef Jean discussing the Fuji's album The Score on its 20th anniversary. Till next time, 